my mother by treating her to a meat and beauty, which I'm told is a giant local iconic ice cream sundae. I don't know if it's still around. Um, but little did my father know that my mother had grown up in a household with an ice cream factory and therefore had a rare condition that, um, known as hypericecremosis. She <laughs> hated ice cream. Um, given this milieu, uh, there were some unforeseen consequences and it would have thus been hard to predict at that time that this traumatizing, gigantic Sunday would eventually lead to 48 years of marriage and three children. Uh, anyway, here I am, thanks in part to the Meat and Beauty. Uh, and this is relevant a little bit because I will be talking about icons in place today through the rules perspective on culture and technique. <clears throat> Um, I also want to note that I'm going to be speaking from the point of view as a of a designer, not so much a scholar. Um, and this is important, important because to be a designer is to daily and constantly confront many of those rules of ideas in a very tangible way. And for me, these ideas determine the kind of work that I do, and quite often the difference between getting paid or not getting paid. So questions about culture and technique are not at all abstract for a designer. Um, Having said this, it's important to recognize that people designed the Wheat and Beauty, regardless of whether this was done in a flash of inspiration over years of development, it was full of intention, meaning, and values, and symbolic power, and it undoubtedly had many other consequences beyond my conception and birth. Um, the point is, we are all designers, even when we don't know it. All leaders are designers. All leaders are poets. Poets are leaders, and designers are leaders. We are intentionally changing the structure and systems within which we operate. We're changing our language even as we speak it. This is a critical foundation of everything that I want to talk about today, that we feel a sense of communality as designers. And while the inventors of the Wheat Beauty may not have seen themselves either as leader, designer, or poet, I believe they were all three. So with that said, I want to read an astounding passage from the world's uh, technological bluff, uh, published in 1986 from the chapter pointedly titled, Is There a Technical Culture? This is a passage that I believe contains both the summary and DNA of what I believe is a little central premise, a premise that is more relevant uh, than ever in today's real view, where technology and culture uh, are widely seen to be inseparable, or even one of the same thing. And the passage contains difficult definitions and radical rhetoric, which I believe are both very good things. Um, so I'm going to read it slowly. Uh, this we beauty of the passage. The culture is necessarily humanistic or does not exist at all. It is humanistic in the sense that humanity is its central theme and sole preoccupation. It is simply an expression of the human. It has human beings and not what serves them at its heart. This includes, of course, all they put in the form of questions about the meaning of life, the possibility of reunion with ultimate being. Is that on there? There you go. Okay, well, thank you. Um, the attempt to overcome human finitude and all other questions they have to ask and handle. But technique cannot deal with such things. It functions merely because it functions. <clears throat> it is self-reproductive. Each technical advance serves first to produce new techniques. It is itself the center of attention and allows of no questioning outside of the mechanical sphere. It is not interested in what serves humanity. Its only interest is in itself. It is self-justifying and self-satisfying. It cannot occupy itself with the human except to subordinate it and subject it to the demands of its own functioning. Culture exists only if it raises the questions of meaning and values. In the last analysis, one might say that this is the central object of all culture, but here we are at the opposite pole from all technique. Technique is not at all concerned about the meaning of life and rejects any relation to values. It cannot accept any value judgment, good or bad, about its activities. Its criteria of existence and functioning are qualitatively different. It cannot give meaning to life nor insight into new values. On any approach, we have to say that the terms culture and technology are radically distinct. There can be no bridge between them. To associate them is an abuse of meaning. It is nonsense. But this does not hamper the authors of political technological discourse. They want not only technical efficiency, but even more so the halo and glory that centuries of spiritual and intellectual life have fashioned around the word culture. Uh, this is obviously a very bold, confrontational, climactic presentation of systems in conflict, um, systems that we'll see in direct opposition to each other. To put this passage into a fresh context, I want to step back and take a quick look more generally at the operating systems that we create and live by. Um, 
systems that we've created to solve problems and that in turn channel our behavior and values. Um, in our video today, I believe we find primarily two sets of systems um, that I'll call complementary pairs, systems operating simultaneously in conflict and cooperation. Um, and here I'm referencing a couple of writings of my own. One is called Tennyson, the American Political Discourse, and the other called The Innovation Paradox, where I get into this in a bit more detail. Uh, the first two systems, or set of systems, is highly visible. Oh, those uh, font choices are quite a nice surprise, but uh, anyway, they look great. This wasn't what I intended. Um, that's going to make the next slide really exciting. Um, these, the first two sets of systems are the highly visible and politically polarizing pairing of regulation versus free market. Together, these systems tend to naively but persistently frame the majority of political discourse in America. And I should say that um, while my parents met here at Wheaton, I was actually raised in Canada. Um, and when I moved to the U.S. as an adult uh, many years later to teach architecture at the University of Kentucky, I was struck by the simplicity of this right-left axis on this side of the border. Not to say that it's so much different in Canada, but definitely there was a sort of difference of nuance. Um, it was this, this right-left axis, axis was supported by a lot of big words like rights and freedoms. Um, again, this is the only use of this font, so here it is. Um, it was something quite different. But uh, these, these words like freedom, rights, individual choice, exploitation, bureaucracy, big government, uh, you know, positive and negative terms that just reinforce the simplicity of this right left axis. Um, and this all felt quite strange to my Canadian sensibility. It would be some time before I would encounter the work of Jacques Ellul at this point, but I was very uneasy with the role of design caught between these two unsatisfactory systems. The intentionality and symbolic reality of architecture and design felt very misplaced, unsatisfying, and quite powerless to live out its premise of human flourishing and co-creation in this one-dimensional context. To make a long story short, uh, this, uh, this dissatisfaction with the way architecture was taught and practiced uh, led to a search for other systems within which design operates. Um, and these systems are many, of course, interlocking and nested, but two became very potent in my search. Um, and those were the systems of culture, and as framed by Clifford Geertz and many others, and the system of technique as framed by Jacques Ellul. For my own purposes, really, I created a matrix just to experiment with the overlay and interplay of these four systems, uh, allowing me to study the conflicts and interdependencies between them. Um, and within this imperfect matrix, there's many interactions and conflicts, but each system has its own unique assumptions and imperatives, which I think is very important to understand. And while these systems are constantly playing off of each other, there's all kinds of uh, realities to each one, and they each demand certain type of behavior or channel channel behavior in certain ways. Um, but one one system among these four stood out to me, and that was the system of culture. Um, why do we need culture? Today? Is culture still important? Is there not a better way to make decisions and solve problems in, in our day and age? Isn't there an app for that now? Um, you hear someone say. Um, and I can't really answer that question fully here, but the question underlies most of Google's work. Um, sometimes put directly as in the passage that I cited, and otherwise implied throughout its writing. And this is a question that is so urgent for emerging uh, leaders today and designers in all sectors teachers, parents, politicians doctors, pastors, engineers, business leaders, athletes, and artists of all kinds. So, to con contem uh, contemplate and intensify and problematize the question of culture's importance and role. Um, I just sort of use this as a map, a conceptual map that, again, is very imperfect, but it allows certain things to um, sort of find an easy placement in this matrix. It ought really to be three-dimensional, in fact. But so anyway, to problematize this question of, of the importance of culture, I want to take a little journey through narrative uh, cinema, specifically theory and some life experiences. I'm going to warn you, this is going to be a bit of a bumpy ride, a sort of roller coaster mashup. So hold on, buckle up your disbelief, and enjoy. <clears throat> a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, it is a period of civil war. Rebel spaceships striking from a hidden base have won their first victory against the evil galactic empire. During the battle, rebel spies managed to steal secret plans to the Empire's ultimate weapon, the Death Star, an armored space station with enough power to destroy an entire planet. 
Pursued by the Empire's sinister agents, Princess Leia races home aboard her starship, custodian of the stolen plans that can save her people and restore freedom to the galaxy. Dot, dot, dot. Time, place, people in conversation and conflict, context and challenge. This introduction to Star Wars by George Lucas sets up what I believe is one of the most dramatic, prescient, and certainly illumined scenes in 20th century cinema, where, in a simple desert hut, a Bedouin-robed Obi-Wan Kenobi reaches into an old wooden box, pulls out a handheld technological device, not much bigger than an iPhone, and hands it to a fart boy named Luke Skywalker. There are many contextual aspects of this scene that are important. The intimate face-to-face -face nature of the transaction, the intergenerational aspect of the handover, the time-worn earthen architecture as the backdrop to this metallic, mysteriously powered device. In this cinematic moment, a vital question is asked. How do our technologies frame the way we interact with one another? Or as Andy Crouch or Neil Postman might ask, what kind of a world does this new device foreshadow or elicit? The moment this mysterious device is turned on is the moment many of these questions are answered for Luke Skywalker. He is illuminated with a purpose and a framework for his life, pursuit, conflict, and values. He is to be a warrior for something. His calling is to confront evil, con confront the evil empire personally. He is to become, quote, a guardian of peace and justice, to join a legacy community called the Jedi. With the illumination of a lightsaber, it becomes clear that Luke will have to develop skills, knowledge, and courage. He will face challenges and difficulty, and this device is certainly not going to make these. This, this device is certainly not going to easily or efficiently solve any problems. It is going to restructure them. It will make his challenges more difficult, not less. He will need community, a community of counselors and mentors. He is in for a long journey. No lightsaber, no Yoda. Um, Parallel to this intimate story unfolding on the planet of Tatooine is the introduction of another device, the Death Star, presided over by a team of technocrats. Princess Leia is forced to witness this giant battle station destroy her home planet of Alderaan <coughs> uh, with a single laser blast, efficiently and anonymously from a distance. No fighting, no faces, no struggle, no personal confrontation or conflict. In the enormous contrast between these technological devices, the arc of the story is born, and Star Wars can be retold as the lightsaber versus the Death Star. <clears throat> Few would dispute George Lucas's masterful creation of symbols and icons, and we can see this in other films like the uh, counter-rational but compelling bullet in Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, uh, you gotta love it, but it doesn't make any sense. But there it is, it's, and it structures the, the story. Um, if you like American graffiti, the hot rod, the car, and that movie becomes a scenario device, full of cultural potential. Um, but icons for what? I believe that without quite knowing it, Lucas created new icons for the conflict between the systems of culture and technique, precisely as framed by Elul. Icons whose narrative potential and thus cultural utility is profound. So we should take note. Uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, we've referenced that already, and it might be destroying a thousand words, but perhaps an iconic device, this is what I was uh, asking of Cliff here, or a well-made focal thing, as Albert Borgman would say, is worth a million. So let's take a closer look. The lightsaber is a small handheld device that becomes a laser sword when turned on. It requires getting three feet away from your opponent, fencing laboriously eye to eye, inevitably talking to him or her, and if you haven't worked out your differences yet, possibly hacking into them. Um, it's so radically an inefficient, it's, it is a radically inefficient weapon, almost laughable, as we are reminded constantly by Han Solo, who's mocking the, the lightsaber constantly, you know, why not use a blaster? So that, we're constantly reminded of how counter-rational the lightsaber is. It's dangerous to self. It requires great skill, respect, and concentration, lest you cut off your own limbs. Each Jedi must hand-construct his own lightsaber, so each one is different. No, no mass production here, it's all local manufacturing. Face-to-face -face contact and physical presence are ensured by the structure of the device. 
Death is not an inevitable outcome, but dialogue and narrative is. Mobility via the lightsaber is framed in the necessity to travel great distances, to spend years of practice in community, and to confront conflict directly in person. <clears throat> and remember that neither of these, these two guys died. In fact, the, the conclusion of the story is the reconciliation between father and son through this framing of the lightsaber. The Death Star, on the other hand, is a giant plant-sized, spherically, he spherical, heavily armed battle station capable of destroying an enormous, uh, destroying a planet from an enormous distance. It's built by a combination of robots and genetically engineered clones, and puts great power in the hands of the technicians who control it. Its impacts can only be observed indirectly through large digital monitors via, say, Skype or telepresence. Zero personal contact is assumed, required, or possible. Mobility via the Death Star is understood by affecting power at a distance, both physically and psychically. It suggests little need for interpersonal contact or conflict. Today, much more than 1977 when the film was released, we're surrounded by devices of our own design, and I would like to ask, are these lightsabers or Death Stars, and how do we know? They look more like lightsabers, and they often fit into our hands. They've got friendly names like Droid, Nook, Kindle, Tablet, Blackberry, and some have less friendly names like Predator drone or Reaper. Regardless of the different names, contemporary techniques have a common theme. They, they facilitate, they make something easier, easier access to information, energy, resources, at a greater and greater distance from human community and dialogue. By doing so, they increase the possibility of anonymity, anonymity and counterintuitively of surveillance, quantification, and control. As new devices and techniques facilitate mobility, Mobility is sold as a private public commodity, a good that all should aspire to. This is witnessed by the hard sell of mobile devices and technologies in the developing world today. They make things faster, easier. Uh, meanwhile, these same techniques, highly armed robots, control the skies efficiently, incinerating people in the Middle East uh, from the push of a button in an air conditioned console in Arizona or, or somewhere else. Um, I'm out of time, so I'm going to jump right to my conclusion here. Um, what would Jacques Lula have thought of the lightsaber? Would Albert Borgman consider the lightsaber a device or a focal thing, for those who are familiar with his dialectic between those two concepts? I'm sure Lula would have been likewise conflicted. This conflict is important and revealing, and perhaps tell us something. Here's the air conditioned console, so I'm uh, operating the drone there. Um, I'm sure this conflict uh, is important and revealing, and perhaps tell us something about our devices, tools, and technologies. The world has often been accused of presenting a hopeless future where the self-augmenting systemic expansion of technique cannot be stopped and humanity is doomed. But this is not the end of the story. As a ray of hope and a totem to human mastery over technical exploitation, we can't find examples of technical inversion where technology is folded back onto itself to create symbols, icons, and patterns for something beyond. This is the subversion of technology for cultural ends. Um, and a version, I think, of the mastery of, of technology and technique that I will hope for. Um, that's the uh, version of the Death Star, I guess you could say. And, and this is a, you know, what kids were doing um, in the 1920s, uh, building you know, gliders and uh, primitive weapons out of wood. I'm not sure if you think about that. The great Canadian pacifist, feminist, Quaker techno technology theorist, Ursula Franklin, who would be turning in her grave, I'm sure, with all this talk about weapons, writes of how sewing machines, first offered to ease the burden of domestic labor for women, ended up displacing the um, cultural practice by industrializing and co-opting it and exploiting, um, exploiting women. Yet the sewing machine today has become a focal thing in the hipster Williamsburg culture of making with legacy technologies. The same sewing machine that disenfranchised people in one era are bringing people together into a new cultural reality today. We've made sewing machine sexy years that do it yourself underwear making for $30, you can participate, bring a t shirt, and use a sewing machine. Ben Kenobi described the lightsaber as an elegant weapon for a civilized time. But the lightsaber is even more than elegant. It's romantic, magnetic, and engrossing, as legions of fascinated children and adults attest. Uh, for leaders and poets and designers, all the same thing, who wish to promote culture as a system for co-creating our world, for exploring meaning, for engaging the imagination, and even human challenges in communication, I leave you with the question, where is your lightsaber? Thank you.